This excellent medical student-led podcast is for educational purposes only and not intended to be used as medical advice under any circumstance. All right, welcome back. If this is your first time listening, we're glad you came and hope you guys enjoy it. It's been an exciting month for us. We had the amazing privilege to team up with the clinical problem solvers and host them as part of our uh, clinical problem solving exercise for our institution's grand rounds. Not only was it an exciting case, but it was so incredible to hear the two master clinicians, Robbie and Reza, show the power of teamwork when it comes to reasoning. So definitely check out our special episode with the clinical problem solvers, if you haven't already. Today's case will take our discussions on quite the journey, and we're super happy to have Tommy back and present lead us for today. Um, I'm Kevin, as you guys already know, and I'll let the rest of the team introduce themselves. Hey, I'm uh, Tommy King. I'm an internal medicine PGY-1 here at Rush University Medical Center, and I'll be leading the case today. And I'm Richard Abrams. I am, I told these guys already, I'm a dinosaur, <laughs> so I am a... Uh, general internist, um, the way general internist, internist used to be. I do both inpatient and outpatient medicine still, and uh, I'm really so excited and happy to be a part of this group. Hey everyone, my name is Sankat. I'm a fourth year medical student of Blanche Neurology. Um, thrilled to be here, so I'm really excited to see what comes up. Nice, yes, I'm Nick, um, also a fourth year medical student here at Rush, and I'll be applying to anesthesia here in a couple of weeks, so also excited to be here. All right. Tommy, why don't we take things off? Yeah, good luck to these guys on their applications. Uh, always an exciting time. Uh, it goes by fast. So um, like I said, so here's the chief complaint, um, our first aliquot of information. So we have a 34-year-old female uh, who's coming in with abnormal urine bleeding and fatigue. And this is right up your guy's alley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so applicable. <laughs> Could not find a better combo. <laughs> Doctor, brief, uh, Dr. Baker stepped in and said, oh, the perfect... Perfect discussions, two males. Careful what you say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I guess we can just talk a little bit about like broad differential first things you, you think of when you hear um, abnormal urine bleeding combined with fatigue, um, given the patient's age. So like any initial thoughts off the bat, you guys, you guys are kind yeah. of thinking. So anytime I see abnormal urine bleeding, the very first thing that pops into my mind is the classic mnemonic palm coin, right? So what polyps, adenomyosis, uh, leomyomas, like fibroids, yep. uh, malignancy, coagulopathies, ovulation issues, endometrial, iatrogenic, and not other classified. <laughs> yeah, that always right. helpful other category. The other. So when you talk about palm coin, how do they, what are the general, like what general category is palm, what general category is coin? I think it's like structural, yeah. right? And then Exactly. So a good way to divide it is structural versus non-structural. Yeah. So is the bleeding coming from the uterus, vagina, cervix itself, or is it coming from somewhere else in the patient's body? Um, so there's um, uh, any other few things you're working, um, you're thinking about. It's like given the pa anything given the patient's age and fatigue that like you're concerned about, or you sort of start thinking more about. I think Nick mentioned a lot of it, but I would just want to go back to the uh, heme aspect of it because it is bleeding, looking into possible causes for anemia, whether it's primary or secondary to the bleeding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great thoughts. Um, um, so just go, we'll go, I'll go through a couple other kind of things here. What's one thing anyone, you know, under the age of say 50 comes in with any sort of vaginal complaint? What do you always want to do about? Pregnancy. Exactly. <laughs> Spoken like people who've taken their emergency medicine show. Um, I am not. Oh, well, not either. <laughs> thanks and you guys are ahead of the game. Thanks for the tip. Um, so you always, you always want to rule out pregnancy and reproductive age women, anyone who's premenopausal, because um, that's not only going to change your diagnostic workup, but it, well, it can change, it changes tests that you can do, you know, um, in terms of what, you know, what you can order for pregnant patients. Um, so that's a good, um, that's a good thought there. So excellent. Another thing you want to make sure is like screen for intimate partner violence, domestic violence, things like that. Um, you know, especially if you're in the ER seeing this patient for the first time. Um, I was, I'm obviously an internal medicine resident, so I, you know, took care of this patient in the hospital on the floor. So that was not the setting in which I encountered them. But um, other things to think about, like medications, are you know, what sort of are they on any oral contraceptives? Are they on any medications that predispose them to bleeding? Things like that. GI bleeding, urinary bleeding can also mimic abnormal urine bleeding. So all things to just think about. But you, I think you guys really hit the nail on the head with um, sort of the palm coin mnemonic, and it's a very good job. Anything else you want to say, guys? Before we move on to our next bit of information. Given the patient's demographics, what two would be lower on your differential from the mnemonic? Malignancy would be lower for me. Any, any others? Maybe um, 
endometriosis as well. That's usually with older females. Yeah. I was also thinking coagulopathy. She's still younger, but I feel like I've always associated that with being younger women presenting with that. Yeah, I think she already would have encountered problems right, right now. I, Great just, I just have to put in that I know Tom, you saw this as an inpatient. Um, this is a really, really, really common point oh, yeah. of people coming into the outpatient setting. And, uh, you know, you'll see this, you know, several times a week and mm -hmm. sort of having a structure and putting your, putting your whatever around it. It, it, it is important. All right, so ready for our second bit of information? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, our second aliquot of information. So in no particular order, just kind of a mess on the slide here. So she, this patient was previously on an OCP, but she was transitioned to an IUD three weeks prior um, because she was having issues with these bleeding. And I think the uh, thought was that from her outpatient uh, gynecologist that that would help control her bleeding. Um, and so far it hasn't. She's gone through about eight to 10 pads a day, fully saturating them pretty consistently for the past few weeks. Additionally, she's developed some bruising on her extremities as well as noticed some gum bleeding. Additionally, she's complaining of leg swelling, weakness, dizziness, and headaches. Furthermore, she denies fever, chills, night sweats, chest pain, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Review of systems is otherwise negative for all intents and purposes. She's currently not taking any medications at time of presentation. Uh, her point of care pre pregnancy test was negative. In terms of social history, she denies tobacco, alcohol, was a drug use, and she lives with her sisters and two children. Hmm. So what do you guys think? Yeah, now that we have this info, it looks like it's been going on, but it's not like an immediately acute problem. It looks like it's been going on for a while. Mm -hmm. Certainly like the gun bleeding and the uh, bruising is sort of standing out. It's like uh, sort of like mucosal bleedings maybe popping out for me. So I'm starting to think, even though like we talked about like a coagulopathy maybe it would be not something we'd first think of. Now I'm seeing this, I'm like, oh, well, maybe it is. Maybe it has some sort of platelet disorder, whether it be acquired or I don't know. I think it'd be rare for it to be genetic and present this late, but uh, certainly something uh, I'd leave open still. I agree. I think he is definitely on the board still. I still think the structural causes are on the board. Just leg swelling kind of is intriguing, trying to put that into the perspective of everything else. But let's see what else is there. Yeah. So when you guys are thinking about bleeding, what are, what's kind of a way you can think about forming your differential based on the patient's symptoms? Uh, so she's coming in with gum bleeding and some like cutaneous bruising. So kind of what, where does that lead you on a diagnostic pathway or differential? Yeah, so when I think of bleeding, I kind of put them in buckets of like structural things, trauma, some of the structural things we talked about, <coughs> then also, uh, you know, platelet related bleeding and then coagulation factor related bleeding. Sure. And it seems like usually coagulation factor related bleeding tends to be like deeper bleeds, like, you know, hemarthrosis, GI bleeds, brain bleeds. Whereas um, platelet-related related problems tend to be more mucosal, so like the gum bleeding, bruising, petechiae, that kind of stuff, that, that tends to be more platelet-related problems. Yeah, for sure. That's a, that's a great way to think about it. Yeah, Nick, you uh, really nailed it there in terms of you know, platelet bleeding tend, tending to be nosebleeds, petechiae, purpura, um, mucosal bleeding, vaginal bleeding, and then deep bleeding often is a little harder to detect because it's you know either organ bleeding, hemarthrosis, like yeah. bleeding deep in the muscle tissue, um, hematomas, things like that. But that's a great way to think about it. Um, so does that, like, what are some things on your differential if you're leaning one way or the other, either Nick or Sanka, as you're thinking right now? Definitely leaning, leaning more towards the platelet bleeding because of her gums. So uh, always ITP is going to be on differential. Other causes could be acquired uh, causes, since we talked about if it was something that was like von Bill of France, for example, that would have probably shown up earlier. Those are the top two come to my mind. What do you think? I also... You know, it doesn't seem like she's acutely ill. It's not like a sick patient. Um, having said that, though, I think something like TTP is also something to consider, mm -hmm. especially since she's fatigued. So you get that hemolytic component as well. Um, and if it were just like platelet bleeding, I don't think that tends to be enough bleeding to cause like an anemia, although she's having a lot of, you know, bad from bleeding. So, you know, she does have the, the dizziness. She has the headaches. Those are like the neurologic components of TTP. So that sort of checks out. And she's having the signs of thrombocytopenia, which checks out with TTP. And then, like I said, she's fatigued. Maybe she's anemic. All those things would kind of add up. Yeah. And it's, and it's a can't miss. So you yeah, definitely. Need to yeah. TTP is a hematologic emergency. And right. You need, um, you know, emergent treatment for that. What if she, what if she was complaining of bloody diarrhea? What would you guys think then? Oh, it's US. Yeah. Yeah. 
Nice. Um, so that's yeah, that's another. So those are that's another one of those uh, you know can't miss things that you need to make sure make sure you're aware. Of. Um, otherwise, um, any types of like organ dysfunction that can cause platelet abnormalities. Splatter. Liver, liver, yeah. yeah. She's like your remix, she'll get platelet, platelet dysfunction. Yeah, exactly. So those are the big, big three things I kind of think of. So splenic sequestration, again, uremia, acute renal failure, and then obviously any hepatic dysfunction can impair your binding factors in your platelets. So those are those are three uh, other good things to think about. Anything else? Ellen? Great start, guys. Yeah, good. Like, you guys are doing great. Casted the broad net, and now I've just laid the perfect foundation to take the next steps with this thing. Um, love how you guys are reasoning so far. Nice. Um, and then other, just other things to be aware of, drugs, patients who are on antiplatelet therapy, always something to keep in mind. Obviously she's young, previously healthy, not on any medications, but that's something to definitely keep in the back of your mind. Um, and then you have your, like Nick mentioned, Von Willebrand, you have Bernard Stuhlier, Glansman's, you know, rare genetic ones, yeah. super rare, but you know, I'd be remiss. Um, you know, if we didn't mention them. And then when you talk about deep bleeding, those are your hemophilias, your factor deficiencies. So excellent job so far, guys. So third aliquot will be the exam. Um, and then we'll get to talk about some labs. So in the third aliquot, I got our exam findings. The patient's vital signs are as follows. Blood pressure is 114 over 69. Heart rate is 107. Temperature is 99.9 degrees Fahrenheit. Respiratory rate is 18. O2 stat is 96% on room air. Uh, the rest of her exam will go through. Constitutionally, generally, she's awake, alert, no, no apparent distress. Her ocular exam, she has some conjunctival hemorrhage present on her right pupil. There's no appreciable lymphadenopathy. Cardiovascular and respiratory, no increased work of breathing, no respiratory distress, normal S1, S2, no murmurs. Her abdominal exam is normal, no organomegaly. Uh, her GU exam, uh, there's gross blood visible in the vaginal vault with one clot. Her MSK exam, there's two plus pitting edema bilaterally. Neurologically, she's five out of five motor strength in her extremities bilaterally. She's A&O times three, sensations intact, no gross neuro deficits that we were able to appreciate. Uh, in terms of skin, uh, she's got multiple ecchymoses appreciated on her arms and legs. Um, she had one on her left leg, a couple on her arms. They're kind of scattered throughout. So what do you guys think? Does this push you down any particular pathway? One thing I was going to bring up that obviously we would need to touch on is like a hematologic malignancy, like leukemia with this you know, easily, easy bruising, bosal bleeding, that kind of thing. So it's a little bit reassuring that there's no like organomegaly, doesn't rule it out necessarily, but that's, you know, a good sign. Um, that was something that came to mind that, that we hadn't mentioned yet, which is I believe leukemia. Yeah, definitely a concerning thing to think about. It can definitely present in, you know, patients younger, 20s, 30s. Right. Um, so definitely, definitely another one you can't miss. I'm looking at the two plus putting edema and yeah. multiple ecchymoses and um, this is a tiny broad and differential the more I might, might be kind of making a turn the wrong direction, but also looking at kind of um, systemic things that can affect the kidney and lead to this edema and these psychoposis as well. What do you think about the heart rate? Yeah, she's a little tachycardic, mildly tachycardic. I learned on the CCU for myself I that the serious rhythm is sinus tachycardia. Because the other ones, you, there's something you can do about it. Yeah. That's when you got to figure out what the problem is yeah. first. It's really the whole vital thing. Just what do you think about the entire yeah. vital sign? So we talked a little bit about the tachycardia, but is there anything there that at least gives you a second to, to pause and think a little bit? Correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Abrams. I think he's getting at sick or not sick. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, I don't think he's sick. I mean, she's in a doctor's office and maybe pretty normal to have a slightly elevated heart rate, but she's afebrile. If you're going by the textbook, um, you know, it's not like she's breathing at 30 breaths per minute. She's standing fine on room air. It's not like she's super hypotensive. So overall, it's not sick. Yeah, well, Kevin's point is well taken. The, 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 the tachycardia does stand out. And, and you're right, people like to be in the hospital. <laughs> they assume that Tommy was a family when this happened. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> all, all the pieces turn. could fit together that yeah. way. <laughs> I, I think that's a solid assessment, guys. I think I think your workup, given the information you have, is pretty is pretty well thought out and put together. So we could move. So I guess before we move on, like, what do you guys want to order? What kind of labs would you want to get on this person if you're admitting her? Definitely CBC for sure. Take a look at that blood count. Take a look at the platelet levels, that kind of thing. Well, all the platelet factors: PT, PTT, yep, for sure. Mm -hmm. 
um, for concern about renal, exactly what I'm the only one, but <laughs> <laughs> um, a BMP would be nice. Um, and also we could also look at liver function because that's yeah, something we brought up. So let's get a CMP. Yeah. <laughs> I'll bring Perfect. that BMP to a CMP. Anything else? I think it's solid start, but. No, let's go with that. Let's start with that. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, we have all the labs here. We have the labs divided into two slides. So first off the bat, uh, we'll read the patient's CMP. So sodium of 139, potassium of 4, chloride of 105, bicarb of 21, BUN of 13, creatinine of 0.53, uh, so BUN creatinine ratio is 26.4, glucose of 197, protein of 2.7, calcium 8.5, T-Billy 0.8, ALKFOS 50, and AST, ALTs 12 and 8 respectively. Then her CBC, she has a white count of 0.58 with an ANC of 50 a hemoglobin of 7.1, hematocrit of 19.8, and platelets of 6. Then on her peripheral smear, her platelet morphology is normal. There's a marked reduction in platelets, but no schistocytes seen. For coags, PT is 10.4, INR is 0.98, and PTT is less than 20. We did get some hemolysis labs, so LDH 259, haploglobin 106, and fibrinogen 263. So right off the bat, that CBC is pretty ugly. Um, she's basically, you know, pancytopenic. Um, the white count's super, super low. Her hemoglobin seven one. Uh, her platelets is six thousand, which are extremely low. I think below ten thousand, you're at like a serious risk for like intracranial hemorrhage. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's like the most concerning lab value right there for me is that platelet count. And then beyond that, the fact that we don't see any schistocytes, uh, kind of rules out that PT or the TPP that I was talking TTP that I was talking about earlier. That gives us a lot of information to rule that out. Same thing, anything else you got with the that fibrinogen and haptoglobin and LDH? What are the normal values? I told you. Yeah, I, yeah, I, know. I wish I had uh, put those in. So what do those, those labs tell you? Fibrinogen, LDH? Yeah, so the LDH, if you have high LDH, you're looking for like a hemolysis, right? Yeah, right. Um, haptoglobin, I believe, is what carries away sort of those byproducts of the hemoglobin breakdown. So if it's low, you know, you have like a hemolytic process going on. Exactly. So decrease haploglobin, increase LDH. Um, and I don't have a reticulocyte site count here. It's on the next slide, but reticulocytes sites would be increased in hemolysis because you're trying to boost mm -hmm. production to make up for um, the hemolytic process that's going on. And that's a, that's a point that's like definitely important um, to know going forward. So. About the kidney. How's the kidney doing? So our BU and creatinine ratio is elevated. We don't love that. That's a, that's a pre-renal elevation, right? It's above 20, so that's a pre-renal, like a hypovolemia or something like that. Yeah, but that does make sense in the setting of um, the blood loss. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's, you know, creatinine is one of those. There's you know, a few, uh, obviously with all labs you want to try, but, you know, things like creatinine, you know, CBC components, hemoglobin, definitely important to try and to find out where patients, where patients live and what their normal values are. Um, you know, to define something as an AKI, it needs to be an increase in creatinine from baseline. So you can't necessarily base a ton off of a single individual creatinine measurement, but good job picking up on that, that that, that ratio is definitely off. And then going back, I know we talked about the CDC, but all that's kind of concerning again for that malignancy that was brought up earlier. So we generally call that the picture of all cell lines being decreased. Pancytopenic. Yeah, so she's pancytopenic. So yep. that should then trigger, you know, another differential in your head of what can cause pancytopenia. Yeah. There's one other lab that I think is worth it commenting on it's almost like it's almost like the the, the heart rate Kevin, and that is i'm going to assume that's the albumin that's 2.7 yeah yeah it's and, and 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 i've always thought the albumin is actually a very important lab and I, I think if you listen to to you know other people they'll say the same thing and so i'll, I'll tell you guys right now that that albumin is low so normal albumin is probably under three four but down once you're in the three under three it's low and I don't know if you guys have any comments on that. That would make sense with her swelling if she has a low albumin. Yeah. And of course, liver is what makes albumin. So, but then you look at the you, ALT and you usually lose your albumin. Usually, the, you're going to lose it in the urine if you're going to lose it. Right. I think before we move on, you know, this is a clinical reasoning exercise, but this was a real patient and we talked about some things. I think this would be a good example of when RX exceeds DX. You know, she has super concerning CBC yeah. abnormalities, and this is a point where we got to put a plan in place before we continue our diagnostic workup. Yeah, for the means, the reasons you already mentioned, right? Yeah, she needs platelets like now. Yeah, yeah. So she's going to need definitely platelet transfusion. 
Um, so, you know, she received plenty of those while she was an inpatient on Sunday. Um, yeah, definitely. Anything else you guys want to do? I mean, if we're transfusing, I know technically usually the tennis like to do it when it's below seven, but, you know, if she's been bleeding for a while, I don't think it's a bad idea to give her a unit or two of blood. Yeah, yeah definitely not. Definitely not a bad idea. 7.1s within the, within the realm of, I don't think anyone would fault you if, uh, <laughs> If, it, if you know, patient's active and bleeding, um, and she's tachycardic, right? So she's yep. getting to that point. You know, if, if her blood pressure was a lot lower, what would you be concerned about? Like an acute blood loss, or yeah. hemorrhagic shock, right? Yeah. Sure. So, um, fortunately, she wasn't there at that point, but that's another thing to think about. I have some additional labs here to kind of round out um, before we get our final diagnosis. So, uh, she had a chest X ray, which did not show any acute cardiopulmonary process, it was totally normal. Um, he had a transabdominal transvaginal ultrasound, which showed a thickened endometrium with echogenic debris slash blood products and gas. She had a UA, which showed brown urine, 30 protein, normal glucose, was negative for ketones, negative for nitrite, leukesterase, had 182 RBCs. Her, <clears throat> her reticulocyte count was decreased. Her RPP was negative. She was COVID negative, HIV negative, EBV and CMV negative. She was parvovirus IgG positive and had blood cultures growing a gram positive cocci and clusters, which eventually speciated as anaerococcus vaginalis. So the, uh, there's a lot here. A lot. About it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just because it's kind of exciting and something ready to see, the first thing that I uh, noticed was that, that parvo mm -hmm. virus, and I, that was IgG, but I know we can get like aplastic anemia with parvovirus infection. Mm -hmm. That was the first thing that stood out to me, or one of the things that stood mm -hmm. out to me. The brown urine and dirty protein makes me think nephrotic. Mm -hmm. um, would also make sense with her swelling. But then, like, the first one, the first thing he said, the uh, ultrasound showing thickened endometrium with the debris and blood products, that also kind of goes back to our initial um, point. Mm -hmm. So I would almost say that that's going back to the structural, the palm part of the mnemonic. Yeah, and I, and I can't remember the exact cutoff for, for different ages, but, um, you know, for a woman who is still menstruating, Obviously, depending on what stage of cycle, it's normal for it to be thickened. However, if it's too thick, then that's concerning for like a, 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 um, a uterine cancer of some yeah, you know, some good endometrial cancer. Yeah, particularly if the patient's postmenopausal, like right. there's that old thing of any 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 abnormal bleeding after after menopause is endometrial mm -hmm. cancer until proven otherwise. Like four or five. Yeah. Years but this, yeah. Years. So that, again, I can't remember yeah, can't not remember. being an OB guy. <laughs> <right>. <laughs> Great. So you guys kind of have had a couple of things that stick out to you. Anything in the, either the previous labs or what I've given you here that makes one diagnosis more or less likely? Yeah, I, I think something that helps is with all the aliquots you've been given, why don't you reframe the patient's presentation with the data that we've given you? So a problem representation. Okay, I'll give it a shot. So <laughs> we have 34 year old female who was presenting with abnormal urine bleeding and fatigue. She was transitioned from OCD to an IUD three weeks ago, splitting to through eight to 10 pads, endorses gum bleeding, bruising, leg swelling, dizziness, and weakness. Um, on her exam, she's slightly tachycardic. She has blood in the vaginal vault, two plus pitting edema, ecchymosis on the extremities. On the uh, labs, it shows that she has an elevated BU and creatinine ratio that points to something for urinal and cytopenia. And um, most recently, ultrasound shows thickened endometrium, UA shows brown urine and protein, and there is an IgG positive for parvo. Nice work. I feel like, yeah, you, got, you covered it all there. Yeah. So <laughs> we, we laid a good foundation for a differential early on. Now, with all this in mind, why don't you help us narrow in on where we're headed? Okay. We started with it being either heme and we divide that to platelets versus coag factors. And then we also talked slightly about the palm coin OB aspect of it. With these labs, the pancytopenia still sticks to a more heme aspect of it. Um, so I won't discount that. There's findings of renal, so the brown urine and the protein. I'm actually having a hard time placing that somewhere. Yeah, uh, me too. And then with the thickened endometrium, I do want to bring back and explain that it might be normal in the setting of having a menstrual period. So yeah. that might just be something that we expect, and that might make our OB initial palm coin less likely. Yeah. Classic example of signal or noise here. And yeah. It's important to think of the context, and I think your reasoning is no one would fault you for that. So good job.
And then again, I mean, just all the bruising, the bleeding, this scary CBC, you know, the pancytopenia, I think we still for sure have to uh, have answer on the diagnosis still, or at least on, or at least on the differential, I mean, um, some sort of bone marrow infiltration or problem producing these cell lines that's clearly happening. I might have missed this, but was there any family history? Not really any family history that we got, you know, no, no pertinent family history to sort of this presentation. And one last thing to mention, it's not up on our slide, <laughs> but Tom, you, you mentioned it, so you might have just been passing, but the reticite is down. So how does that, what does that suggest? It seems like the bone marrow isn't working the way it should because in a setting of elevated um, LDH, you would expect it to be elevated, like Tommy said. So she's, that's, you know, that, right? she's not so, compensating correctly. She's not compensating appropriately. Where do you want to investigate next? Biopsy. Like take, yeah, take a look at her bone marrow too. Would yeah. I think be an important next step? I agree. So, so bone marrow biopsy was performed uh, and revealed uh, a blood clot within the marrow with a fragment of subcortical marrow space that was markedly hypocellular and consistent with aplastic anemia. Mm. So there we have our diagnosis. You guys did a great job of getting there at the end. There's a lot of, there's a lot of detail in this case, you know, was the edema necessarily related to the presentation of aplastic anemia? Not necessarily was the, you know, the fact she had thickened endometrium sort of a distractor a little bit, but you guys did a good job again, searching through the signal and the noise. Uh, and I will say this patient was diagnosed at another hospital and then came to us for her, her long-term treatment. And so we didn't get the initial diagnosis. Um, so I took care of this patient on team teach our inpatient hematology service. Um, and so I didn't get, you know, the initial diagnostic. So I didn't see her when she initially presented, but saw her over the course of several weeks on the floors. Did you end up getting a, uh, an answer as to why she had the aplastic anemia? So they thought it was consistent with parvovirus. She had um, parvovirus at the other hospital was positive. <laughs> uh, she did it, was, it was hard to tell. She did receive IVIG Ooh. over there. So it was hard to tell when the timing of that was. So it may have been a distractor. Yeah, right. <laughs> she does have kids. She's around kids. So that, that was wondered. But other than that, all the other common, I have just some brief teaching points about aplastic anemia. Um, so all the other common positive HIV, EDV, lupus, um, things like PNH, Fanconi anemia, yeah. you know, she had no liver injury. It can happen with hepatitis. Uh, so all that was, all that workup was negative. So we didn't have a super clear explanation. Hmm, interesting. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but what's the most common cause of aplastic anemia? Guess, any guesses? In adults? Yeah. Is it parvo? No. I think it's a it's a it's 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 myelodysplastic. It really is yeah. part of a myelodysplastic syndrome. And and that would be you know, certainly the older you get, you be, the more likely it would be that. Yeah. As a younger person, this person's relatively young, you know, obviously as Tommy has here, I mean, there's all these, there's all these other causes that, that sit there. And sometimes time is the is the answer. And I, I don't know if you, if you know the time, Parvo, most of those people will get better with time. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know she how she did. did. Yeah. She had a pretty long hospital course. She had MRSA bacteremia. She's actually readmitted to the MICU a couple of weeks later. I think she's doing okay now, but she's had a long, Poor lady. a long course. Yeah. Of course. So Dr. Abrams, are you saying that um, if, if you see an aplastic anemia in an older patient, the likelihood that it's idiopathic is much more likely than if you see a younger patient with aplastic anemia, you'd, you'd think there'd be a cause behind yeah, it. Yeah, that would, right? that would, and at least I'm guessing here, but You're a pretty I, smart guy. So I'm going to go. That. <laughs> but I think myelodysplasia, yeah, is, myelodysplasia would be, and I'm looking, I'm looking at you guys also, who probably have studied this more recently than I have, myelodysplasia would be my guess with, with people like that. Is that idiopathic? Uh, right. Less, less so now than, than, than we maybe thought it was. Yeah. It's a good point. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. And MDS is more common in older people. It can progress to AML. So when I went on my team teach month or two weeks, I saw a few MDS patients who progressed to M AML. Saw a patient who had a different type of cancer had MDS from that tr treatment. They came out we got for that transferred to AML. So that's something you tend to see in older individuals. Wow. Um, so just really quick, some aplastic anemia stuff. The hallmark feature is pancytopenia. All three cell lines decreased with usually without splenomegaly, usually no abnormal um, red cell or platelet morphology on smear. Um, it'll be pancytopenia with hypocellular marrow in the absence of infiltrator fibrosis. So essentially it's in the absence of any other cause for pancytopenia. Mm. We talked about what was associated with the different viruses, different conditions. 
Usually it's going to have recurrent infections like this patient presented with back with anorocarcus vaginalis bacteremia. She was treated for that. She later got MRSA bacteremia. Her ANC was low the entire time she was with us. Uh, additionally, um, you know, mucosal bleeding, menorrhagia, things like that. Pretty much these patients almost always need to be admitted with severe, you know, with their, if you have an ANC under 500, platelets under 20K, um, you know, she had an ANC of 50, she had platelets of six. This was a patient that needed to be hospitalized and treated. You'll see exam findings, you know, petechia, um, pallor, bleeding, um, usually not in large lymph nodes or liver spleen. Um, so those are some things that can help point you toward the diagnosis. We talked about the bone marrow. It's going to be hypocellular, decrease in all cell lines, mostly fat cells and just normal marrow stroma. Finally, the two big components of treatment, overall immunosupp immunosuppressive therapy is what you want to do. So some combination of, and this is a more of a heme fellow level topic, but uh, ATG, which is like anti-thymocyte globulin. So it's like horse antibodies, basically, as far as I understand it. <laughs> uh, steroids, she was on a long, long course that we had her on a long taper of prednisone. We tapered her prednisone outpatient over like 35 days. Cyclosporin and then symptomatic support, they need irradiated platelets um, and promacto, which can help stimulate platelet production. Additionally, uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant can be considered if patients are medically fit enough to tolerate it. Uh, so this, our patient also um, needed HLA matched platelets. Um, she actually began responding to transfusion after we HLA matched her platelets. So she was just getting a unit every morning and never responded. Mm -hmm. But with the HLA matched platelets, we were able to get her like up to over 50. And she actually had a you know pick line placed for her IV antibiotics mm -hmm. outpatient. Uh, and then lastly, um, as a future ID uh, person myself, they do need prophylaxis while they're neutropenic. Interestingly, they don't require bacterial prophylaxis that chemotherapy patients usually have. So usually chemotherapy patients will be on Levaquin because they, the chemotherapy has a toxic effect on the like lumen of the blood vessels. So that gives you a higher risk of like invasive um, pseudomonas infections. So for them, for patients with aplastic anemia, they do need PJP prophylaxis. So pentamidine or atobicrone, which is not first line, usually it's Bactrim, but Bactrim can cause cytopenia. So you don't want to use Bactrim in these patients. And then finally, if the ANSI is below 200, uh, you want to give them fungal prophylaxis. So either posaconazole or oraconazole, you're mainly worried about aspergillus. In these situations, you can get Candida too, but aspergillus is the one that's going to be most dangerous. And then valacyclovir is usually given for viral prophylaxis. There's not great data behind it, but it's something that's typically done. And that's it. I got a question for you, Tom. Oh, yeah. That is the, the, the bacteria that she grew out of her blood. And oh, I, yeah. is, is that a, is, is that, I assume that that is a, you know, whether it's a uterine tract yeah. or it's, a, it's, it's, it's specific for, for, for that part of the body. Yeah, right? it is, so it's G, it's normal GU flora. Right. Um, and we, I took over her care about halfway through her hospital stay. So she had already been treated for that and cleared it. But I, I believe that, that it is normal vaginal flora that has somehow extradiated into her bloodstream. Because possibly because of all the bleeding. The and bleeding the and then the no platelets. And, yeah. And so it just, it's a contaminant more than anything. Yeah. You think of it as a contaminant, except in some people has no white cells or platelets <laughs> and <laughs> bleeding all over. Thrives. Yeah. Yeah. So she was treated for that and then treated for her MRSA bacteremia that she got later in her hospital course. And yeah, again, these are, these are patients that are very, very sick. So yeah. even though initially, and again, you, it's hard to really picture a patient without physically seeing them, even though initially her information was relatively reassuring. She was a sick, sick patient. One, this is, this is my experience. One little thing can essentially be fatal. So a little bit that gram negative bacteria that just manages to squeak in there. If the platelets drop low enough, with six, sometimes they drop to two and one, and then, yeah. and then spontaneously bleed everywhere. So I got one story for you. Can I tell you yes, a story? Yes. Please. Because I love this story. <laughs> this is a story I found this morning. Um, so this is a story of famous people with aplastic anemia. Oh, fun. Okay. So <laughs> they, who would be famous with aplastic anemia? So here we go. So in 1960, the age of 75, Eleanor Roosevelt, you guys know who Eleanor Roosevelt yeah. is, she began to experience weakness and fatigue. And her physicians found out that she was anemic. Um, and so they started on blood transfusions. It, I don't know if you guys know much about Eleanor Roosevelt. She was this great, you know, besides being Franklin's wife, she was this humanitarian. She traveled all over the world and did things like that. But anyhow, so by 1962, so about a year and a half later, her anemia gets worse. And she also developed low white cells and low platelets. And she had a bone marrow at that time. And it showed that she had aplastic anemia. Here is 1962, and what did you do back in 1962 to treat this? The same thing you do now, they gave her steroids, yep. okay? <laughs> so a few months later, she's hospitalized. She has high fevers, a dry cough, anemia, 
And uh, she has a chest X-ray done at that time, which showed no infiltrates, but did demonstrate scarring consistent with possible old tuberculosis. And that was so common back then. Mm. She, she, had, she said she had pleurisy when she was a kid. And, and they, she was in the hospital. All the tests were negative. And she ultimately, they did a second bone marrow biopsy to look for granulomas in her because they were afraid that she had TB and it showed no granulomas. But even though it didn't have any granulomas, she was, treated, she was empirically treated for TB with the drugs at that time, which were isoniazid and streptomycin. Mm -hmm. So she got better for about two days and then she got worse again. And uh, it, she didn't want to die in a hospital. So she actually signed out AMA ah. and went back, <laughs> and went back to her house. <laughs> yeah. Went back to her house on the Upper East Side of New York. <laughs> and then six weeks later, she died. Uh, so they did an autopsy on her and the autopsy showed that she had disseminated tuberculosis. She had no granulomas. And so her cause of death was felt to be miliary tuberculosis. But now we get to the good part of the story. Okay. So the good part of the story is right before she died, they actually, she had the, they did cultures of her bone marrow, which came back positive for tuberculosis. And so everybody wondered why she didn't get better because she was treated for tuberculosis. Yeah. So ultimately they speciated, they, they, they found the sensitivities and it turned out that the tuberculosis she had was resistant to INH and streptomycin, oh, which, is, wow. which is weird because she acquired, everybody thought she acquired it as a young woman, which was before they had any antibiotic, yeah. any tuberculosis mm -hmm. therapy. And so how in the world could she have resistant tuberculosis? And so the ultimate thought was that she actually got it later in life when she traveled around the world, she acquired tuberculosis in the fifties and sixties, because by that time there was resistant TB. Wow. So, so she was thought to be, it was thought to be a second, it was acquired in older age TB that killed Eleanor Roosevelt, but she had aplastic anemia as her underlying disease. Wow, that's, that's interesting. interesting. That is that's awesome. Great. So well, if it was I a know, reactivation, yeah. she presumably would have been sensitive. Yes, yeah, that's right. She, <laughs> she got it when she, she was in twenties, she would have, it would have been sensitive. Wow. The lessons do not travel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so this year and uh, yeah, they should have us. <laughs> well, <laughs> thanks, Tommy, for coming back. Thanks, Nick and Sankit, yeah. for joining us. Uh, of course. I would be honored to have you guys as my doctors with the way you guys reasoned through that. And I think this patient, <laughs> she would have been lucky to have you guys, too. You guys did a great job. Um, I hope you surprise yourselves. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. We'll be back soon. And until next time. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks. Thank you, you guys. I don't know. I had no idea that's how she died. I'd never heard that. I feel like that's not common knowledge. I didn't hear until this morning. Yeah, so there you go. It's like, who are famous people who died of, of, of April?